uh, Keeping the World Company here on ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel. And our guest today, our esteemed guest, is uh, Jean Rosenfeld. Uh, she's uh, a, um, an independent scholar, came from UCLA in history and the like. And she joins us today to discuss exactly what Putin's vision is, what his aspirations are, and how all of that helps us understand what he's doing. Welcome to the show, Jean. Thank you, Jay. So, just in a, in a rough way, what are Putin's aspirations and what drives him? What kind of strange, you know, personal experience is he having to justify in his own mind what, is he, what he's doing? I think we have to take the statement he made about the fall of the Soviet Union being the greatest disaster of the 20th century at face value. What matters to him more, it seems, uh, is Russian nationalism, the history of Russia, and the future of Russia. And so it's a kind of patriotism, then? It is a misplaced extreme patriotism. And uh, when you get into extremes of anything, you get into danger zones. Yeah. Well, his, his danger zones seem, seem to incorporate all these really grotesque things that he does, you know, like kidnapping children, uh, torture, war crimes right across the board. And you wonder whether that is in his kit bag anyway. You know, you can be a patriot without doing those things. Um, so um, sort of ingrained in the DNA of his, quote, patriotism are some pretty nasty elements. Are those historically identifiable? Well, they're both personal and intellectual and ideological reasons for where he stands right now. Number one, you remember that when East Germany, uh, the, the wall fell, that he was involved in burning all the documents in East Germany because he was a KGB operative, now FSB. And uh, so that must have been a shock. That must have been a really shock, a big shock for him. And it's reflected in the statement we just talked about. But then also there's the context of the man. Um, there is a history behind where he stands today. And that is, you go back to Peter the Great, who was one of the uh, more important czars, the, the czar who was behind the colonization of North America and Russians, Russia's rivalry with the United States in the 19th century and the 18th century even. Um, when Alexis de Tocqueville, the, the uh, great French writer, observed in 1835 that Russia and the United States were, quote, natural uh, rivals. And still today, there's a battle for the Pacific then, there's a battle for the Pacific today. So that's not different. In Europe, it's the battle for that set of countries between Western Europe and Russia. Russia is always suspicious that that flatlands is going to be in, uh, the subject of an invading army. Whereas Europe is very very sensitive to invasion from the east. They've had the Mongol invasion, they've had the Muslim invasion, and they've had recently, since Yalta conference in World War II, they've had the takeover by the Soviet Union of the countries uh, from the Balkans to the Baltics. So we have a natural history, and history, in a sense, does repeat itself, but the details are different. Wow, so this is all something you could have, which de Tocqueville and others predicted. And uh, here we are, and it almost seems it's inevitable to continue, that it's always, am I right? It's always going to be thus. Well, the relationship that we have with Russia uh, is at sometimes very quiescent. After all, it only took them a month to decide to sell Alaska to us, <laughs> and that was fortunate. Um, we are a Pacific power. If you look at Alaska geographically, and I, I love geography, it turns out, but <laughs> look at Alaska ge geographically and you follow the Aleutian Islands, they almost touch Russia. And if you look at our Pacific Island holdings, if you look at um, Hawaii, for example, the Hawaiian chain, as you well know, goes to the northwest about a thousand miles and almost touches Asia. 
So we are legitimately a Pacific power. And you recall the lead up to World War II was our rivalry with Japan. And so we were contending with Japan over the power uh, of, of, you know, deciding the freedom or the control over the Pacific Islands. Now, we have been a country that has gone into the Pacific Islands, the Philippines. We were in control of the Philippines at one time. But we give back. We don't keep territories. We have a, a federation of Micronesia in association with the United States. But all those small islands rule themselves. Um, Samoa is divided between itself, Western Samoa, and American Samoa. But we don't control in the way Japan was controlling before World War II, or in the way that China seems to want to control now, or that, you know, Russia colonized. So we have to kind of pat ourselves on the back. We don't do that often enough. Well, <clears throat> we pat ourselves on the back, and yet, let me, uh, let me tell you a short story reported in the Times, I think it was, years ago when Trump first took office. It was a visit to the gun show, a large gun show, and a large convention center kind of facility in the South. And the, and the Times reporter walked through there. This is, what, 2017, maybe? Walked through there, talked to people how they felt about Russia. And uh, most of the people um, that uh, the Times reporter talked to said, we've given Russia a bad rap. They're really nice people, and they have only the best intentions in mind. And, I, you know, my, my view of it is that they were, they were getting that from Trump. They were getting that from the conservative Republicans, and they still are. Um, and so does the country fully understand, does it understand at all what you're talking about? I think not enough. I think, first of all, Putin has a grand design that we need to learn about and keep in the forefront of our mind. And that grand design is to is is called Eurasianism. And the two architects of that in that you know developed the idea uh, are a man who lived around the time of World War II and happened to be in Germany and is, was a kind of neo-fascist or proto-fascist, I would say, not neo-fascist. And that is Ivan uh Ilyin, I-L-Y-I-N. And then lately there's uh there is uh Alexander Dugan who is also a neo-fascist, uh, who want, who look forward to Russia fulfilling its historic destiny. And that's something that Putin also agrees with. In other words, it's um, the Russian state that really matters. It should control, have, have control over the Eurasian continent. It should relegate Western Europe to um, basically a, uh, the satellite economically and sociopolitically of Russia. It enlists China in this and now North Korea to, um, to implement this vision, which Putin expressed in a, a very important uh, speech in October of last year at the Valdai uh, International Conference. And the Valdai Club is something founded in Russia, and the state is very involved in it, as is a, a leading university, in inviting uh, to an international conference each year countries that it wants to assimilate into its sphere of influence. And those are particularly the large developing countries, the BRICS, the so-called BRICS countries, which are Russia and China and South Africa and India and Brazil. But beyond that, they want to make inroads. And we've talked about this before. But the whole point is to divide and conquer, to uh, take away from the United States the hegemony, uh, the unipolar uh, support for democracy in the world. I say we give back, not always, but we do give back when we take uh, other territories. And we have to remember that we do that because we have a particular kind of political philosophy called democracy. And the people in this country who support Russia now don't understand that what they're doing 
is undermining what America stands for and has always stood for and still stands for. And yeah. so this is a, this is an international thing, and it is a type of fascism. There's no doubt about it. Um, Ilian, um, Ivan Ilian called it a third way, like Mussolini. He supported Mussolini. He supported Hitler for returning traditional values to Europe, which is what Putin wants to do today. He's anti-LGBTQ. He's 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 only wants the Russian Orthodox Church in power. Uh, he is four square uh, behind quote morality and spirituality that reflect um, the czarist values of the traditional culture, and and that is is an extreme of traditionalism, which goes into ultranationalism, which then becomes fascism, and it's happening here in tandem with that, and that is now the ideology they're exporting. For in the Cold War, we were very conscious of the fact that there was a whole Marxist philosophy that Russia had adapted to its own unusual circumstances, Marx wouldn't have agreed, uh, and sent that throughout the world. Now we are contending with the type of Russian fascism, and we need to understand what it is, where it came from, what his vision is, and what he intends. Mm. Can you connect, you mentioned the czar, the monarchy in general. Can you connect up what the czars were doing, what the monarchical Russians were doing that somehow influences uh, Putin? Well, I don't think he wants to bring back the czars, but he does model himself after Peter the Great. And Peter the Great is the Russian czar who brought civilization, we would say, to St. <laughs> Petersburg. Putin is, I believe, from St. Petersburg, and it is a prime example of, of French culture imported by Catherine and Peter into Russia. And, you know, they really, they want to absorb these kinds of things from Europe, the culture and the beauty, but they want to control it. They don't want the democracy. They don't want the revolutions that occurred there. We have to understand that to Putin, Muscovy is the center of the universe. And that Muscovy has to be united with Belarus and Ukraine because those are the three brothers of Rus, R U S, of the culture and civilization that he so admires and embodies and thinks is so much the center of the world. How did Russia lose Ukraine? Beg your pardon? If that's uh, the three brothers. How did Russia lose Ukraine? Lose? Yeah. Well, Yanukovych was in place until, I think, uh, 2014. And then there was an election and he was deposed. And Russia didn't tolerate that because they had, you know, basic control over Ukraine through Yanukovych, their little satellite. And so Ukraine is a very important country, potentially. It is rich in agriculture. And it has access to warm water ports, which Russia has always wanted and needed. That's why Crimea is so important. And it's, it, it then is open to the world because Russia doesn't have warm water ports except a little piece in the Baltic Sea next to Lithuania and Poland. Um, and that's why the Arctic is so important. When it's melting, it now becomes a potential huge coastline. Half of, Antarct uh, half of our, uh, the Arctic Ocean is Russian territory. Oh, no. so, so in Ukraine, you know, we, we hear stories about the creativity of the Ukrainians, the resilience, the sense of patriotism, commitment. Um, is the Ukraine culture remarkably different than Russia and Putin? Um, is it um, the kind of place that is actually m more likely uh, to be democratic? Um, what is the difference between um, the Ukrainian, uh, I don't know, ethic, the Ukrainian character, 
and the, the character that, that uh, Putin elevates in Russia? Well, you know, you'd have to ask Tim if he's not Snyder of Yale about that, because I, <laughs> I will say this. If you look at the most intransigent and terrible conflicts in history, they're always between siblings. And so we fought England. And that was tough. And we fought them twice before they gave us up. So, it, you know, Ukraine is one of the three brothers. And actually, Russia began in Ukraine. It began in Kiev. And it was the Scandinavians that established Kiev. And they took the surrounding peoples, the Slavs, as slaves. And that's where we get the word slave. And for 100 years, they were not Christians. But Russia has revised this narrative to say that Muscovy, the black brother, not Krasny or yeah, the red brother, is really the dominant brother. And that it embodies Russia even more than Ukraine. And that Ukrainians are Russians, basically. They have the same religion, same culture, similar language. And the territory is so important to control. So do the Russian people understand what you're talking about? I asked you if the Americans understood what, you know, what, what Putin was all about. But what about the Russians? Do they understand about the Slavs? Do they understand about the brotherhood with Ukraine? Do they understand the Muscovy that you described? Um, or, or are they just responding to an autocrat? I'm not a pollster for Russian people, and I agree with you. The Russian people have been saddled with bad governance for centuries, and I feel for them, and they're wonderful people, and they have great culture. Um, do they understand? That obviously, the cognoscenti, the intelligent class, the educated class, they understand all of this, and it's hard for them. Uh, and I'm sure almost all Russians uh, who are ethnically Russian know about their history and their religion, their identity, their territory. And yeah, hmm. I imagine they do, just like our people in Appalachia or Idaho or anywhere know or think they know. Hmm. So there have been, um, you know, programs, at least for what, a couple hundred years, in Russia, there's been anti-Semitism in, in Russia. Um, where does that come from? Is that ingrained in Russia now, today as well? Um, what, what does it mean to Putin? I, I don't think he's so focused on anti-Semitism. And as a matter of fact, Jews throughout the world have come to recognize and support Ukraine. And that Ukraine has a Jewish president now. and all of that. As far, as far as Russia is concerned, there's a terrible history of anti-Semitism. The protocols of the elders of Zion, that terrible conspiracy theory that was sent throughout the world uh, about a small group of uh, Jews want to control everything in the world. That that began in, in Russia by uh, people surrounding the Tsar in 1905, and it, it was transmitted to the United States through the Port of New York, and then Henry Ford took it up and republished it in, a, in his newspaper and called it the International Jew at a time when we were having a lot of Jewish emigration from Eastern Europe and Russia to the United States because of pogrom, because the Cossacks. You have to understand that like every large territory, people by the same individuals uh, who identify with one another, uh, there are parts that are tolerant and parts that are very intolerant. And the Cossacks who, and the people who instigated the pogroms were, were intolerant and not very educated um, in many ways. They, like Putin, they see and value only what is theirs and which they claim in the circle of their identity. And this is 
a way in which tribalism, a, men, a mentality of tribalism develops and people then fight one another and have horrible work. You know, um, one more piece to set the stage on where you know Putin is driven today um, is the whole thing about the, the Cold War, about Stalin, about um, Lubyanka prison, about the, the Gulag, and uh, all those things that Solzhenitsyn wrote about. Um, how ingrained in the Russian culture is that? How ingrained in Putin is it? Uh, why do people, uh, you know, accept that kind of brutality, um, and for that matter, accept Navalny being in prison for another 19 years for doing obviously nothing? Um, what is it in the Russian culture and in in Putin's approach um, that relates to or incorporates a kind of Solzhenitsyn brutality? Well, interestingly, Alexander Solzhenitsyn was um, imbued with very much the same ideology of Russian nationalism and traditionalism and the Greek Orthodox Church. Um, he listened to Ilyan and uh, uh, Ivan Ilyan and agreed with him in many ways. Uh, but he was, of course, a person with a very different experience in the Gulag and a, a, a very strong feeling about human rights and ethics. Um, you know, we have a range of expression too. We have Abu Ghraib, uh, we have Guantanamo. You know, Ron DeSantis was a lawyer at Guantanamo and oversaw forced feeding of prisoners, which is torture. Um, we had abuse of prisoners, horrible abuse of prisoners. So, and, and we committed genocide against the American Indians. The longest war in our history, I don't think, was Afghanistan. It was the Indian Wars of the 19th century. So, in that sense, we have a common humanity of both good and evil. And we need to look there for the reason. In terms of the brutality of Stalin and, and Lubyanka and everything, if you really believe the end justifies the means, you will go to any means to achieve the end. That helps explain Putin then, doesn't it? If he feels that torture or kidnapping of children justifies the, the end, um, then he has no reluctance. Is that what's happening? I think we have to look at the human soul rather than ethnic identity. To understand why people behave the way they do toward one another. And I'm doing that in my own research right now because I, I am doing research on fascism and the, some of the horror, well, <laughs> the worst behavior of one group of people against another in human history was the Germans against the people they put in concentration camps and the genocide. So we have to understand that. I want to understand that. And, and I have to go right down to the basics. Of human psychology. Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, I always say we're mammals and we're not always rational. And there are there are things that live within us that are uh, that are not good. You uh, you're talking about your writing, but you wrote an article recently. Can you tell us about the article you wrote and maybe hold it up so we can see it, at least part of it? Uh, well. Once in a while, I write a few things, submit them to the Star Advertiser, and they've been kind enough to print some of them. And this was an inside article. Mm -hmm. Wait, I got to get it in front of me. And then if I put it in front of me, I can't see it. It was on Putin's mind. And uh, I, I wanted to bring in the power of myth. I've had the privilege of co teaching with a scholar named Ivan Strensky. And uh, he held the chair in the history of religions at the University of California at Riverside for many years. And uh, while we were teaching one time, he had to go to Ekaterinburg in the middle of winter in Russia, was a program funded by George Soros to teach Russian PhDs how to teach religion because during communism, religion was not 
uh, permitted to be taught. And so uh, he made a lot of contact among uh, educated, intelligent Russian people. He's kept up those contacts and he has um, he has been able to get letters and and correspond with these Russians while the Ukrainian um, war has been going on with Russia. And he also has a Ukrainian descent, so he has contacts, relatives in Ukraine. So Ivan and I have talked and corresponded over these years, and he's a wonderful source of information. He's also gotten very interested in researching and writing about fascism, which he's doing, but in regards to Trump, which I'm also doing. So we have a lot to talk about. Anyway, he's the one who brought to my attention the myth of the three brothers and how Russia is committed to keeping these three brothers together within its confines. And that is Belarus and Russia and Ukraine. So it becomes a, an almost fratricidal war for him. He cannot let his brother go. And it's, it's fratricidal wars that are based on ideological, particularly religious, spiritual concepts are the most difficult to resolve. And so Zelensky too is implacable. He, he will not regard giving up Crimea. And Russia, of course, has been in a struggle of control for Crimea for centuries. And so we're, we're just dealing- well, you suggest You suggest that- you know that because of this um uh, uh, brothers um the three brothers and uh, and the fratricidal nature of the war against ukraine um that it will stop at ukraine that there are many people who speculate that it will not stop at ukraine whatever drives putin will drive him into the baltics um, and um maybe the balkans um, and he will move west into Western Europe as and when he can. And that, uh, yes, Ukraine is a strategic buffer, but it is also a jumping point. So how does that reconcile? In other words, if he's got a special thing about Ukraine, historically, ethic, ethnically, and all that, oh, yeah. um, does it stop in Ukraine? No, it doesn't. Zelensky is absolutely right. And I... I felt that way from the beginning about this too, because, you know, I'm half Lithuanian and uh, they really know the Russians. All you. the best people, honestly. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> not because I'm half Lithuanian, but because of the history of it all. Um, Russia and Sweden have fought for that territory for centuries. And in 1709, at the Battle of Poltava in Ukraine, which was then part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, ruled by Lithuania and Poland and the king. Um, Russia defeated Sweden and uh, deposed the king and put its own king on the Commonwealth. And then they did this again. This was again during Peter the Great. You have to go back to Peter the Great to understand Putin. I think that's his archetypal person and what was going on then, both in the Pacific and in, in Europe. And what brings this all together today is this Ilian Dugan political philosophy of what's called Eurasianism. And that's what this great speech that Putin gave last year that we should all be familiar with is about. It's about Eurasianism, meaning that Russia wants to have geopolitical and economic control over the Eurasian continent from Vladivostok to Dublin. We need to understand that. And that, not that they want to go into and take over France and the UK and Germany. They just want to render them neutered. They want to neuter them. And they want, to, they want a different currency than the dollar. Um, they want to use the resources of Siberia to become very wealthy. They want to control the port and the trade. They want to enlist the... Um, cooperation of unaligned countries, which they're doing right now over the divide over support for Ukraine. They're, they're beginning that. And they have an uneasy alliance with China. It will always be an uneasy alliance, by the way, I believe, because ultimately down the road, they are competing empires and metropoles. So this dynamic is going on right now, and we need to understand. 
Yeah. You know, it strikes me that um, Putin is doing a lot of other things in the world. Um, he's involved in all these diplomatic organizations and groups. He's trying to um, create and, and uh, enhance groups that are anti-American. Um, and I think of BRICS, for example, but there are others, too, where he creates these conferences. Even if he can't go because he's under a, an arrest warrant, he still encourages them. And he, uh, wizard without Prigozhin, he's got a presence in in the, the Sahel, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and he's trying to be influential in Latin America as well. And I wonder how much of all of that, I mean, I haven't ended, I mean, there's many other things, um, you know, to say his uh, social media hacking, uh, to say his attempt to influence elections elsewhere, um, to say his, uh, his espionage and his, his, his punitive treatment of people who turn against him, you know, uh, who have to leave and they're then poisoned and so forth. Um, it seems to me that everything the man does these days has got some connection with his drive to, to take over Ukraine. Uh, am I right? Or is, are, these, are these driven by other, uh, other, other um, factors? Yes, he, he's driven to um, undermine and get rid of what he calls the great hegemon, the United States. And this is, again, part of the neo-fascist philosophy of Russian nationalism that uh, Ilyin and Dugan have developed. Um, he's driven to um, make Russian civilization the great civilization of the future. Um, he's driven by nationalism. This is a spiritual commitment of his. So it, he wants to replace the world currency. Uh, with maybe the Chinese yuan. And then he's involved in uh, getting allies where he can because we have sanctions against him. He wants to get rid of the sanctions and he can't travel, as you pointed out, everywhere he wants to travel now because there's this other great power in the world that is standing against uh, the development of the future of Russian civilization and dominance. And it's not necessarily a territorial dominance so much as it is a sphere of influence and dominance in the way that we have created that kind of influence in the world. And it's gotten so close to him with Ukraine, with the overthrow of Yanukovych and the putting of, you know, a, a, a real democracy in Ukraine, it's insupportable because the enemy is democracy and it's right on his, right as his doorstep and he can't support it. One other thing before I ask you what I consider an important question is um, constantly he's saying that the Ukrainians are the fascists, they are the Nazis, which, which seems to be, you know, really ironic because the Nazis killed a lot of Ukrainians as they killed a lot of Russians, but Ukrainians are certainly not fascist. There's no indication that that's true. So is that completely poppycock propaganda? Um, or, and why does he say that? Why would the ultra-right in the United States say that Trump is going to fix everything and that we need to change how we vote in the United States. We need to replace basically a dictator in the United States. We need to get rid of the civil service and just appoint the people who are loyal to, loyal to us. It's uh, fascism and uh, fascists will uh, do what human beings do psychologically and that is project their own sins and misdeeds upon the people they want to control and conquer. It's all about power. And it, truth means nothing because truth is negotiable. In fact, I mentioned Ivan Strensky. Uh, he's writing about the influence of pragmatism on truth and lies in Trump because in 
pragmatically, the philosophy of the United States that we embody is, you know, just make it happen. However you make it happen, make it happen. That's what counts. <laughs> Do it. And if you have to make a lie into truth, you make a lie into truth. I mean, that's the weakness of pragmatism. Kellyanne Conway, the alternate reality, when she, at the early time, I guess it was 2016, got up there on national television and defended lies, I said, we are really, really, really in trouble with this. How can you operate democracy on this basis? And what's odd is that her husband, maybe her former husband, George Conway, appears on liberal television and takes liberal positions. I don't understand it. I'm, I'm, I'm really wondering what their pillow talk is like. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> in any event, uh, my, my, my wraparound question for you, Jean, is this. So through this discussion and through the writings and through a lot of uh, uh, observers and commentators and analysts, uh, we do know uh, a fair amount how Putin's mind works, and we know, you know, the background, the uh, cultural background, the philosophical background of his agenda and his vision and so forth. But is it realistic? Is it likely to succeed? And that's one part of my question. The other part, which fascinates me, is, <clears throat> is he like this? Is he doing these things because he really believes in it personally? Or is he doing these things for political purposes? Because he pe he feels that he can stay in power if he projects these notions of um, a vision for Russia, an agenda for Russia. Um, I I really don't have a sense of what the answer to that is. Maybe it's a combination. What do you think? It's operating on both levels, because uh, power is is the essential ingredient to fascism. And uh, it, the retention of power is the basic fundamental floor on which everything else rests. And, and the leader embodies that power. Um, and in order to remain in office and, and enact the vision that he has, that he believes, and does he truly believe it? Absolutely. I'm absolutely certain. And even if we can't verify that, we have to just accept that is most likely because only by accepting that political philosophy as influencing him and that he really believes in, can we predict his next moves and anticipate what he's going to do. No, this is not about just Ukraine. Zelensky is absolutely correct. It's about Ukraine and Lithuania. Poland and the United States. He wants to take power away from us to neuter us, basically. There's, a, there's an element of this incredible Roman patriarchalism and virility. Uh, virtue, after all, is a word that, that pertains to males because virs is the Latin <laughs> for male. So virtue naturally is defined in male terms. And anything that questions that or dilutes that is unacceptable in fascism. And so it's it, it's all in the mix, Jay, I'm sure. Well, one other element that might be in the mix, I'd like your, your thought on it, is, you know, when we talk about Trump and we look and see what Trump has done over the past few years, we think he must be out of his mind, that, you know, that he has psychiatric problems and that he's just a, a, a nutcase, uh, unhinged, as you will. Um, but uh, so the question I put to you is, is, does Putin really believe it? I mean, does he believe that he can achieve these things? Is he being realistic about it? But also, is he a nutcase too? Does it matter? Was Hitler a nutcase? Was Stalin a nutcase? Does it really matter? I mean, what do we mean by nutcase? I'm not a psychiatrist. Uh, do I agree that, that Trump is off base? Well, if you took, say you took 10 billionaires and then you took 10 convicted murderers or rapists and you gave them all the same psychological tests, <laughs> you might find mm. they had a lot in common. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great answer. 
Thank you, Gene. Gene Rosenfeld, uh, an independent scholar and historian uh, who, would, who joins us today to discuss uh, uh, the vision, uh, the agenda of Putin and how we can figure out what he's going to do with it. Thank you so much, Gene. Thank you, Jay. Aloha.